Hey everyone, and today's going to be my first champion guide, which is a pretty frequent request I get. So hopefully you enjoy the content, and if you do, please let me know. Today we're going to be doing a Nautilus guide. I have played this champ hundreds of games, including both solo queue and professionally. So I really wanted to share what I've learned, and this champion is absolutely running rampant in the meta for this year and actually for the last couple of years, so this is a perfect time. Um, this is going to be a much longer than usual video. It's going to be very comprehensive, and I really wanted to go all out in um, a guide for this champion. So I recommend that you watch this in parts if necessary. I'm going to put timestamps down below in the description for you to check out um, whichever segment you want, or if you want to just one shot the whole video, that's completely up to you. I hope you have the attention span for it. But otherwise, I'm going to be covering uh, several different points. I'm going to be covering um, Nautilus's identity, his place in drafts, his runes, his items, uh, his abilities, and his lane matchups, his combos. Um, I'm going to be explaining and reviewing um, his early lane. And I'm going to be explaining and reviewing his mid to late game. And it's also going to be talking about the 1% that separate good Nautiluses from great Nautiluses. So before my, uh, before my intro takes up most of the video, let's jump right into this guide. Let's talk about Nautilus's identity now. Why pick Nort? What does he want to do? And what situations does he want to generally avoid? So for the early game, he is one of the strongest laners in the game. His passive base damage is really high, his Q base damage is high, um, the Q hitbox is really large, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, his W flat shields, so flat values in early lane are really powerful, especially shields. Um, uh, that's really useful for his trading patterns. Uh, he has a really long range, easy to hit Q. And the Q also bounces to put your uh, enemy like by your auto attack range, so it's... Uh, not as committal as some other champs, and you can really just decide which trades you want and which you don't. So practically, he's really, really strong in lane. He's really good at picking. Um, he also has a strong level 1, and this can look uh, like a, a couple of different things. It can be great for level 1 invades, where you can just get your auto attack on a bunch of enemies, or you can reliably look to land a Q on someone. Um, and also early in the lane, uh, in the first wave and a half, you can look for Qs, and it is very, very likely that you are going to win trades if you uh, trade off of your Q into your order. So you can be aggressive in the first uh, section of the lane, and then when you hit level 2, you can have an even bigger HP advantage. <clears throat> and one of the main points about Nautilus's identity is that he's really easy to execute. He has a point-and-click uh, CC ability, which can never be um, understated in League of Legends. Um, and it can also hit multiple people. His Q, the hitbox, is very forgiving. Um, and even if you do uh, land your Q, then the bounce makes it a forgiving trade pattern for you. Um, and relatively non-committal. And he's also hard to counter. He is... Uh, yeah, he, he's very hard to counter in the laning phase, and compositionally, he can always look for picks. I will mention that what he wants to avoid is uh, front-to-back 5v5 even footing fights because his Q can't reach the back line in that situation and his ult, it's not the longest range and it is quite slow so they can uh, the back line can kite away from your ult and the front line can stand their ground. So those are the kind of situations that you want to avoid and therefore his weaknesses are versus uh, champs or comps that excel in the front to back that he can't get through or that he can't thread in the back line with. So we're going to quickly talk about his mid to late identity now. He has that point and click CC like we talked about. So he excels um, in picks and he can reliably engage uh, skirmishes and uh, obviously look for picks. But in the team fights, um, there is surety in his ult hitting, but it is slow. Um, so yeah, in the mid to late, he wants to control around the mid lane. He is relatively immobile. He will struggle to access uh, side lanes and get back. He doesn't have any um, yeah, uh, big mobility spells like Pike or Bard would have. And he doesn't often build mobies either. Um, and he also struggles to land his Q in uh, more tight uh, scenarios and chokes or just around jungle corners, things like that. So he really does excel around the mid lane 
and finding picks with his Q. Um, typically, this will look like you looking to Q on uh, a contested mid wave. Um, if they contest your mid wave, you look to to Q into R and look for picks. If they don't contest the mid wave, you get mid prior and then you control uh, a mid bush. You control the side. You set up vision and then you you control the map and you avoid that even footing five v five regardless. So yeah. Um, as we talked about, he struggles in that straight up 5v5 front to back. So um, controlling through mid, mid prior, mid pressure, picking around mid wave, picking around uh, river fog by mid. I want to talk about his place in drafts. He is really strong and he is very easy to execute, as I mentioned earlier. Um, other engagers like Leona, like Alistair, like Raul, they are much more committal. So they have to go in and commit. And if they pick a uh, poor time to fight, then they're just going to die. With Nautilus, you can fish around for cues. You have uh, for giving trade patterns, uh, and you have a point and click ability, which is uh, really really easy to use. So he's easy to execute, which makes it friendly for uh, people newer to the role or newer to the engager class, or just for solo queue in general, because uh, ease of execution will play a large part um, in a consistent performance. Of course, you don't have to be a one trick. So yeah, as my opinion, he has been broken for quite a long time and solo queue is only just starting to pick up on it. He has been running rampant in competitive uh, support picks for years now. And um, yeah, he's really strong. He's really blindable and he can be, um, he can be blind picks. Like you can ask your teammates to just pick him up and then you can give the counter pick to your teammates. Uh, and he very rarely struggles in comp, uh, in comps, especially in solo queue, <clears throat> where picks tend to be more carry oriented. We talked about him uh, not liking the 5v5 front to back too much. That could look like Braun or Sedge or Zac or like Tank's top. Those aren't the meta, and even if they were the meta, solo queue is much more carry oriented, uh, where people want to be independent and be the, the carry of the team. <clears throat> So he is especially strong versus immobile carries. Um, sorry, <laughs> he's especially strong versus mobile carries, although he is also strong versus immobile carries. Uh, the mobile carries I'm talking about, you can think of Zeri. Um, even in competitive play, uh, people will uh, ban Nautilus and pick Zeri, or uh, pick Nautilus into Zeri as the answer to Zeri, because she's so mobile and you have that point and click ult, she's going to get locked down for sure. That is uh, very hard to understate once again. So uh, other mobile champs uh, could include uh, LeBlanc, it could include Kiana, uh, maybe Kindred, maybe Lucian. Uh, if they have a lot of dashes, uh, even a, a Kali, um, you can just press R and you don't have to do anything else. You can just hold your Q after the R hits and use it. And you've found an engage on, a, on champs that thrive on not being able to get engaged on. And then we can talk about the immobile carries quickly. So you can picture like a Jinx or an Aphelios. Um, they are much more susceptible to getting hooked than the other champs. So you don't even need to use your ult then. So his hook is great for mo uh, immobile carries and his ult is great for mobile carries. And overall, he's just really strong. Okay, let's talk about lane synergies now for Nautilus. And he pairs uh, the best with all in lanes. And these are going to include champions like Samira, Kaiser, Tristana, Draven, even Jin, for that 2v2 all-in threat, where Nautilus has a lot of setup and a lot of base damage. I would say Samira is probably the deadliest combination for the 2v2, um, but he is not necessarily tied into needing all-in. He can pair um, and function uh, perfectly well with a lot of other ADCs. These can include Ash, Varus, MF, Zaya, Aphelios, Jinx, all of these still have respectable lane damage and can potentially even provide follow-up CC. I would say the worst pairings for Nautilus are the Ezreal and the Vayne, where they don't have uh, much 2v2 pressure, they don't have much wave control, and a lot of your power is just going to go to the wayside by them trying to scale up and farm. Okay, now for lane counters. Nautilus is too strong to match his all-ins, and Pike with Hail of Blades is the only exception here, and even if 
uh, if you take the Halo Blades, Bone Plating, Unflint, uh, Bone Plating, and Shield Bash setup, maybe not even him will be able to counter you. So the way that you generally want to counter Nautilus is that you uh, pick champs, uh, compositions, or even supports that are uh, better in the front to back and are hard to engage in all in. And champs like this uh, include Renata, include Braum, um, and honestly, there are not many more. Maybe uh, a competent Thresh who can time his E well to disengage your Q. Maybe uh, Morgana who's really diligent and maybe puts a lot of points in E. But for the most part, Renata and Braum are the most commonplace answers. And this is because it's really hard to engage and kill them. Braum, he's too tanky, he Qs you and then he wins the extended trade. Renata... Um, it's really hard to engage on her. Her E is a fantastic tool to disengage. Same with her Q. Um, so, yeah, those are the two best. And otherwise, he's just a really strong champ that's hard to counter. And the counter will come from other positions in the mid to late game for uh, the front to back where he does sometimes struggle. Okay, let's talk about runes for Nautilus now. In almost all of his games, you want to go Glacial. And the Glacial path is going to look like Glacial, Hex Flash, and then Futures or DMAT, depending on what boots you are going to buy. I'll go into that when I talk about items. And then uh, Cosmic uh, over Time Warp now, since uh, Time Warp got nerfed. I talked about pressuring with runes in an earlier video where Time Warp uh, provided the most early pressure with a burst and healing. It has been nerfed, and Cosmic giving that Flash cooldown reduction... Uh, is a, a, a stronger pick right now, in my opinion. So that's the primary tree. Secondary tree, you're going to always go Resolve. And here you're going to decide mainly between Second Wind and Bone Plating. Second Wind is good versus double range, and it's good versus uh, champs that aren't going to all in you, that are going to poke you out. Um, whereas on the other hand, Bone Plating are going to be good versus all in lanes. And when you expect to get traded heavily on, but you're not going to get whittled down beforehand. Uh, an example of an all-in lane could be maybe even Lucian Braum, otherwise uh, Samira's, Kaisa's, Tristana's with engagers like Leona's, like Ali's, like Raul's. Um, so yeah, uh, you choose between Second Wind and Bone Plating, and then it's going to be unflinching in almost every situation. Uh, very rarely is tenacity unnecessary. It, um, it also stops uh, slows, which uh, happen just from a lot of sources. Uh, it's very rare where you have a comp where you're not going to get CC at all. But in the very rare situation where you deem uh, tenacity to not be necessary, you can consider either revitalize for your shield or um, font of life or even shield bash, uh, typically shield bash for the extra laning power. But yeah, most part, uh, second wind or bone plating and unflinching for secondary. Let's talk briefly about Glacial, and I see a lot of people take Aftershock over Glacial still. Glacial provides, uh, obviously, extra CC over Aftershock, and it also provides the utility in teammate damage reduction. Um, and Nautilus, as a champion, his trade patterns are very um, forgivable. They are uh, forgiving. He queues in, they bounce back, he has his W to keep himself sustained up, it's not very hard committing... Um, you don't need the extra survivability from Aftershock in a lot of situations. Um, Glacial also helps to lock down uh, Enchanters. Uh, and these uh, that, that class in solo queue is typically more common than Engagers or other classes. Everyone wants to play the, the scaling range champ where they don't have to make too many proactive decisions. Um, but even in tough uh, Engager matchups like Leona, you don't even necessarily need Aftershock. Uh, there's a specific trade pattern that you're looking for there where Leona ease into you, you cue her and then it bounces her away from you. She can never get her auto off and you call the trade done right there. If you are looking to heavy trade, maybe if you want to lane versus Leona and just match her uh, straight up trade pattern, look for the auto WE afterwards, you can. Maybe even like... Versus Lucian Braum, if you want to hook in and they're going to stand their ground and look to fight, maybe Aftershock could be better there. But for the vast majority of times, I recommend that you go Glacial. Um, 
So yeah, I talked about the the situation with maybe Leona and maybe Lucian Braun where you want Aftershock. The other uh, matchup where you want to consider Aftershock is versus Pike. He is the only champ that can match and potentially outperform Nautilus's early pressure with his base AD and with his Halo Blades that he takes uh, and his EQ at level 2 is really, really threatening. Um, so, yeah. There is one exception that I want to talk about here that I have been theory crafting a little bit. Um, I've been taking Halo Blades versus Pike to actually match his laning pressure. And then the theory behind that is you match his early game and you can, you're not going to get outscaled by Pike in the mid to late anyway, so you don't have to worry about yeah, uh, losing too much early, uh, losing too much scaling versus uh, Pike specifically. And what that uh, tree is going to look like is just indexing into as much early laning stats as possible, and that's going to be Halo Blades, Cheap Shots, and then Zombie plus Relentless. Um, and backing it up with uh, Bone Plating and Shield Bash for those stats, like I'm talking about. And this is something that I have tested out uh, several times already, and it has had some pretty good results. I feel like I can actually match the pike in the early lane, and I don't have to concede uh, the first 8 to 14 minutes of the game. But I will put a, a, a cautionary... Uh, label on this uh, rune setup and say uh, you might want to yeah you, you might want to start off with glacial or aftershock and just get used to those trade patterns instead the halo blade that's it's quite psychotic there's a lot of heavy trading and you need to be really confident uh, and obviously it does scale worse but you know i i think it might be a good answer to maintain naught as being the strongest uh, early laner in the game so I realized after recording everything that I didn't talk about the flat stats that you can get at the end of the rune page at all. And so I want to just add in this post-mortem to the video to talk about what the best setup is in this instance. I think that the most pressuring setup you can go in almost every situation is attack speed and then adaptive force and then armor. Um, there will be some instances where you're versus an AP mage in the bot lane and you'd rather take magic resist. But I am not convinced by the argument that you'll ever need to take uh, double armor or double magic resist or armor plus uh, the, the scaling health. Um, I think just the flat value from the adaptive force uh, is much more valuable than a second defensive option there and this is especially because they will start to give diminishing returns and just to quickly talk about the attack speed option i think attack speed is really strong on a lot of supports this can help to shove in uh the early game and it can also help to clear out wards um, and to just weave in that extra auto during a trade that you might not otherwise get but if there were to be a deviation from this setup, in my opinion, you could go a second adaptive force rune so that you can get the most burst uh, and the most damage during your lane combos. I want to talk really quickly about Nautilus's order of abilities. You take Q level 1, of course, and you max Q first, and then you take W level 2 and you max W second. Uh, I see quite a lot of people taking E second the damage is not really that significant the slow is not going to be that significant early on the the flat difference in hp between w and between e is quite a lot so your w it gives you an auto attack reset really important early on it gives you a flat shield which is really important and it gives you some bonus damage on your autos so overall w is much better seconds and it helps you to sustain yourself up so q max first w max second Q level 1, W level 2, E level 3, and then you should be able to do the rest from there. Alright, time to talk about items for Nautilus. And the starting item, the most popular is Relic Shield. He has respectable AP ratios, especially on his Q and you max Q. Uh, you can definitely make an argument for shoulder guards, as within his trade pattern he has an auto attack reset. Um, but mostly, uh, he should be in winning lane matchups, and that extra AD shouldn't necessarily change what happens in the lane. But if there's a, a, a lane where you're expecting a lot of heavy trades, then uh, shoulder guards can be more favorable. And also with my experimental Halo Blades build versus Pike, you definitely want to go shoulder guards. 
So after the first item, we're going to talk about boots now. And really any type of boots can uh, work on Nautilus. It just depends on the situation. You can build Mercs uh, versus a lot of uh, heavy CC opponents. You can build Tarbies if you are versus a lot of auto attackers or just a really heavy AD comp in general. You can build Mobies if you want to maximize the first 14 minutes of the game by roaming around a lot. Uh, maybe there's a volatile mid matchup. Maybe bot is harder to kill. Maybe you have or the enemy has an Ezreal. Uh, or there's a Yumi. Uh, so you can build Mobies as well. You can build Swifties if uh, Mercs and Tarbies aren't that attractive this game. Or they have a lot of slows instead. And if none of the above, you can also still build Lucidities. But realistically, one of those uh, previous options is going to be uh, relevant for that game. And going back to uh, the runes when I talked about deciding between Futures, Market, and Dematerializer, um, I believe that if you take, um, if you want to build Mercs or Tarbies, then you don't need Futures. You can go Dematerializer for that lane pressure. Um, because uh, Mercs and Tarbies have a smooth build pattern. You, you can get the Cloth Armor and you can get the Null Magic Mantle after you have a Health Crystal and after you have Boots. But for the other boot, uh, for the other boot options for tier two, uh, it can be quite hard to get enough money to actually buy them, and that's where the futures market can come in hand. If you go back to base and you're on like 400, 500 golds uh, with futures market, you can get that mobies, you can get those swifties, you can get the lucidities if necessary. Uh, but yeah, you're never going to have that issue with the mercs and tabis uh, build path. Okay, so we've talked about starting items. We've talked about boots, and now let's talk about the next item, which is going to be Mythic. You're always going to rush Mythic after your boots. And as for most engagers, the Mythic option is going to be between Locket and even Shroud. And these are both uh, items that are in a pretty decent spot. There's not one of these that are just way better than the other, and you're building them constantly. Uh, so they're in a healthy spot, and you want to ask yourself, what is the situation? Do you want to be able to one-shot, or do you want to provide some sustain for your carries? Um, so, yeah, you can ask yourself, are you, are you looking to one-shot? Do you have a, a heavy burst comp? Maybe you have an all-in ADC, like we've talked about, the Samira, the Kaisa Tristana. Um, or, or maybe you have uh, Assassin Mid, Assassin Jungle. Uh, you can just ask yourself, are, are you, is your comp reliant on bursting the enemy? Another useful question to ask yourself is which team has the DPS advantage? Which team does more sustained damage? If your team does more sustained damage than the enemy team, then Locket is more valuable so that you can keep your sustained, carry, uh, sustained DPS carries alive. If the enemy team has more sustained DPS, then you want to kill them. You want to one-shot them. You don't want to extend fights. Locket is for extending fights and peeling. Even Shard is for bursting. So hopefully you can make a better uh, informed decision now between Locket and between Even Shroud. Okay, so after the Mythic, it's time to think situationally. And the second item is always going to be situational. Right now, the situation is there is a lot of healing in the game. There is uh, Conqueror, there is Gore Drinker, and there is Death Dance running around in top and in jungle. So it's quite useful in a lot of situations to build Thorn Mail Second, where you can provide the healing reduction for your team, and then your carries don't need to opt into uh, healing reduction. They can maximize their build path, maximize their damage, whatever. And the thing with Thorn Mail is that it does apply when you CC enemies, not only when you get auto attacked. So whoever you are looking to lock down, they're going to have that heal cut. It's going to be relevant. Um, and yeah, the, the health and armor, the stats are pretty good as well. So Thorn Mail is a great second item if your team needs heal cut. We can talk about other situational items now. Um, you could build Thorn, uh, sorry, you could build uh, Frozen Heart second if there is um, a lot of, uh, if there are a lot of short range uh, auto attacking champions on the enemy team, maybe their top and their jungler want to get right in the face, their bruises. Maybe there's a, you know, a Zin Zhao or a Renekton or um, a Jax or a Camille uh, or a Trundle. There, there could be many, many options here. Um, so 
if Thor Mail doesn't look too good, then uh, Frozen Heart, if it can give you that attack speed reduction value, it's great. It becomes even more attractive if the enemy mid laner is melee, um, so that you can apply it to them as well. So that's another situational item. You don't want to build it versus a, a heavy poke or a heavy disengage comp that's not going to get up in your backline's face. Um, and then otherwise there are also um, a nice vow if your team is really heavy uh, in the DPS uh, category. If you have a hyper carry ADC and mid, let's say you have like a Jinx and a Victor and then you have like a really hard front to back comp and you need to keep your carry alive, then you would want to go to Knight's Vow alongside Locket in that situation. Um, the only other item really considering is Zeke's with Frozen Us. Uh, Zeke's with Even Shroud when you are trying to index into the one shot, into the burst. Um, that Zeke's uh, providing extra damage can be really important in getting that one shot or not getting that one shot. But only build it if you really, really are fully indexing into trying to burst down the enemy team. And then the very last item I'm going to mention, although this should uh, quite rarely be built, is Anathemas. This is more of if all of the above don't really apply, or if they have an insanely fed uh, carry and you really want to lock them down. In that situation, you'd still want to consider even Shroud and Zeke's, but Anathemas, you could make an argument for that if it's just one really fed member that you want to reduce damage on and get a bit more uh, CC with your auto attack. For the most part, your second item should look like uh, Frozen Heart or Thorn Mail uh, or Night's Vow or Zeke's. And if the item, uh, sorry, if the game isn't done by the third item, then you want to get the warding item. Um, I forget what it's called off the top of my head, but it's the one that upgrades when you're level 13. Um, so if you are level 13 around the third item, then you want to get that. It gives you great value for stats and for extra vision control. And if not, if you're quite EXP starved, you just consider the next best situational item. Uh, and then eventually you buy the warding item once you have enough money and you are level 13. Alright, so we're going to talk about Nautilus combos now, and I'm going to cover the ones that are mostly going to be able to be used in your games, not all of the possible fancy ones. These are ones that are actually going to come up in most, if not all, of your games. So the first uh, combo I'm going to talk about is just a really basic combo, how to get the most out of your basic spells, and that's going to look like Q into Auto, W, Auto Cancel, and then back off slightly, and then press E. So... You hook in, you auto, and then you just move slightly out of your auto range and then all three procs of the E uh, hits as you uh, hopefully just saw there. The next combo I'm going to do, it's a bit of a flavor of the month uh, combo where you cancel your auto and then you hook and your auto cancel uh, of your passive, your champion doesn't turn um, when you throw your hook. So like this, I'm going to cancel my auto, and then you see how he was just still facing forwards. What that would look like in the bot lane is, imagine there's a wave here, and you go to use your relic proc, uh, but you cancel your auto, and then you throw your Q out instead, and it can be quite disconcerting or awkward to react to if, the, if Nautilus isn't actually facing where he hooks. Okay, the next one we're going to look at is R Flash. So this is where you, um, you you start buffering your R and then you flash and then it redirects the starting location of your R. Um, what this is going to look like is, let's say I want to knock up both of these uh, champions. Then I'm going to, to initially R this one and then flash this way. And then my champion is going to face in the direction that he flashes and the R starts in the direction that Nautilus is facing. So it's going to look like this. Um, this can be really good. I, I'm sure you can imagine some kind of skirmish or team fight where you you want to try and knock up both of the uh, enemy champions like this. It doesn't matter which one you go for. Obviously, I can ult this one and then redirect it onto this side. Uh, this can be yeah really good in a chaotic environment where you still have your R and your flash and. This is definitely worth practicing. It might seem hard, but um, no, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, you just 
you just flash in the direction and the alt uh, starts where your new location is, uh, whatever he's facing. Okay, and the next one I want to mention is Q into R. So this is where you need to, um, yeah, you Q one target and then you R and it's going to hit both of them. And this is similar to the R flash. Your Q obviously makes your champion face a direction and then your R has that slight buffer time. So uh, you Q one and then you R another and it's gonna hit both of them. So this is what that'll look like. And then this target gets queued and it gets R'd. Um, we, we can do it either way here. Um, I'll just do it this way. So what you want to do is Q and then R, right? Before your Q hits. So Q here, R here, and then both of them are going to get hit. This could manifest in a bunch of different scenarios. This is just the, I guess, the most visually compelling one to see. It can literally be any kind of combination. Um, as long as, let's say I want to hit these two, okay? Then I'm going to Q and R, and it's going to do the exact same thing. And this is like... A combo that is very, very rarely used and very easy to execute, um, not too flashy or anything. So yeah, this is this is the other one. Um, and then the last one I want to talk about is just a good old flashed R flash, good old fashioned R flash, where let's say this is like an Israel or something. You just like straight up press R, he has time to E, he has time to flash, he has time to make a lot of space. But if you really want to get that instant knocker before they can react, you R flash. Um, and this, yeah, this just eliminates their time to react. And the, the finer the line that you make uh, with your R flash, the, the more instantaneous you can make it. So yeah, imagine this is an Ezreal and then you R flash and then you just insta burst. And, you know, hopefully that'll, that'll be a lot better than the situation where they have time to react. So just to go, uh, just to talk about all of them again, you have your basic combo where you just want to maximize your DPS. So you're going to be using this every game, hopefully. You have this, the, the flavor of the month, auto attack, cancel, into Q. Honestly, this is just like a bit fancy and I hesitated to put this into this combo video in general. I'm not... Uh, this isn't really necessary, but, you know, maybe sometimes uh, it'll help you find the hook. Maybe not. Um, but, yeah, the R flash is definitely very useful um, in terms of hitting both both enemies, right? Not not necessarily like the, the instant knock-up into the Ezreal I was showing, but just um, R on one enemy and then flash redirect. You get an instant knock-up and you still get both of the enemies knocked up. You can look for opportunities to get multi-man knockups here where you otherwise wouldn't be able to. Um, and then the Q into R, this should be used a lot as well. Um, just get used to uh, throwing out your R before your Q2 hits and it'll knock both of them up. And then the Insta R flash, this is more, yeah, this is, this probably won't be used as much. It's more niche. It's when you expect enemies, if they have flash or dashes to react to your R, you can just instantly knock them up and uh, have a good team fight from there. So I want to talk about Nautilus's laning phase now and what to do and how to approach the lane. Um, I will preface this by saying a lot of what I'm going to say here is going to be covered in the Support Fundamentals laning video and in the Support Fundamentals comps video because um, how he approaches the lane is uh, quite, uh, is a, as an engager and is not necessarily unique in a lot of these things. So those video links are going to be in the description below. Otherwise, what you want to do is you want to control midbush. You want to either ward and sweep midbush or put a ward anywhere uh, on the map, on camps, around mid, and then sweep for midbush or just start sweeper. Having sweep for midbush is the most important part here. And what having sweeper and controlling midbush allows you to do is to prevent your first wave from getting completely destroyed really fast and then having a disadvantage for the second wave. So you control midbush, you prevent your ranged minions from dying on the first wave, and you look for opportunities to find hooks. And you should be able to find a hook. So the two situations are they either completely respect your midbush pressure and they don't hit your uh, range minions at all, and then you don't find a hook, but you're going to get prior. 
or they disrespect and you look for a potential angle to find a hook. You either wrap around their range minions on the first wave after they have crashed, or you just uh, look for a hook on either side of them from fog. You can also look for a hook when enemies are coming back from leashing. Um, it should be very easy to hit one of them if you are camping in a bush or if they are taking a greedy path back to lane. Um, so yeah, that's the first wave. Second wave, you are going to use your relics on the melees and you're going to hit level 2 and then you're going to look for an all-in. And hopefully you would have hit a Q beforehand to soften them up a little bit, but your level 2 damage, really strong. And that's mostly an engager type of playstyle, control mid bush, all in level 2. Where Nautilus comes in is that his short trades are really, really strong and his Q is really easy to hit and he has a lot of level 1 power, which is not that common for engagers. Um, so what you really want to get used to is the trade patterns for Nautilus in lane, where you Q in, uh, level 1 you Q in, you order, you just get out as soon as possible, and you don't extend the trade. Because Nautilus, uh, he enjoys short trades, he wants burst, and his sustained DPS is not great. And he's also a melee champion, which hurts for that. So, uh, yeah, uh, level 1 you Q in, you auto, and then after level 1, your short trades patterns are going to look like you Q in, you auto, you W, auto reset, and then you move slightly backwards and uh, slightly out of your auto range, you press E, all three of the E procs are going to hit the opponent and that's your window, you back off. So that's going to be how, what kind of trades you're looking for with Nautilus. In terms of wave management, this is going to be straight up just general uh, engager wave management. You want to avoid ping pong and what I describe ping pong is as you're just constantly shoving waves into the enemy tower, uh, hard shoving. So you shove a wave, they catch on a the tower, they farm safely. You shove the next wave, they catch. You shove the next wave, they catch. And you can never find an all in and they're safely farming up and scaling. Um, you want to either crash stacked waves so that the following waves slow push back into you and you can have more time to roam or do whatever you want. Um, or to create freezes on your side of the lane. And that's the main point and where you're going to be able to find agency in the 2v2 in an extended laning phase where they have to extend in, um, onto your side of the lane. And then you can look for hooks. There's no way that you can find the all-ins when it's frozen on their side of the lane and they're right outside their tower. So hold freezes on your side of the lane and ping your ADC to not uh, mindlessly shove waves so that they don't play ping pong and they don't just constantly feed waves for free. You're creating a freeze on your side. Then they have to extend into the lane, you find hooks, you find all-ins, and you're happy. With all of that being said, let's have a look at some examples of Nautilus's laning phase. So here we're going to start off, we are MF Nautilus versus uh, Jinx and Zillion. And we're going to do the standard engager start. We're going to ward midbush, we're going to go back for sweep. We're going to, we're going to control midbush. Um, and we're going to play for our level 2 spike. But we're also going to look for opportunities to use our hook um, in the early levels, uh, on the first wave, level 1. So they step up a little bit, I find a really quick trade, and then I back off. And it's really important to get used to trade windows like this, where you understand that you excel in short trades, and that's it. And I can't all in the jinx here. I can't 100 to 0 her here. This is just going to be a quick trade, damage, and then get out. And now you can see my champion is just high tailing it out of there, just running as fast away as possible. If I commit for an all in here, uh, I'm not going to be able to achieve it. And I would waste my ignite, or I would just take so much damage uh, on exit that it wouldn't be worth it. Or if I try to extend this trade for any longer, if I'm just standing here trying to auto. Both of these champions are going to auto me, and then their minion wave is going to come in, and the trade's going to look really bad once again. So, short trade looks really good here. So I do the short trade, and then I'm trying to posture for level 2, but actually in this game I miscalculate, and I expect to hit level 2 here on this minion, and then I'm pathing forwards looking for an all-in, but we're one minion short. Um, but I still, I'm still trying to posture forwards for the level 2, I still don't get it. It's a little bit unlucky, but... Um, yeah, it is what it is. If if we back off around here, um, I'm going to be low, and then they're going to be low, and then I'm going to look to control from the bushes again and look for a Q. But unfortunately, MF gets caught out, and 
we're gonna lose this all in. It happens. Um, eventually, I survive. And yeah, it's getting a little bit messy down here in the bot lane, but that's going to happen in solo queue. I'm going to hold the wave here <clears throat> because we want the wave state to be near our tower, um, on our side of the lane, frozen, so that they have to overextend so we can look for picks. That's what my champ wants to do. I hold the freeze, I base, I come back to lane, and they're losing uh, wave after wave, so it's in a really good spot for us. I'm not just brainlessly shoving waves and then donating the minion waves to be collected. I am maintaining a good wave state. We'll just speed it up a little bit. It eventually, it's going to slow push away from us, but that's after they have lost like two, two and a half waves, maybe. And so I'm going to be pressuring from fog and looking to crash the next wave. Maybe I can find a hook here. Maybe I can't. And yeah, I mean, we're just playing the seesaw with wave stage right now. Uh, we, we want to crash the stacked wave, but here's a great example of why Hex Splash is really broken in lane. You can just find insane gank uh, angles, uh, not gank, just all in angles with Nautilus. Um, yeah, with Hex Splash and the range of Q, you can just pretty much cover half of the lane. It's quite ridiculous. So I Hex Splash, I find a hook, and this is exactly what you want to do is Nautilus, right? I didn't force an error this time uh, with wave states. They could have collected it safely under their tower, but I am still trying to look for opportunities to 2v2 all in, especially versus uh, an enchanter like Zillion. So we're just skirmishing right now. We get some kills and our wave state is good once again. And here is going to be uh, another showcase of how Hex Flash is just really strong on Nautilus. Uh, or engages in general, but yeah, I I don't have sweep and I want to play around there potentially being vision in this area, so I'm going to hex flash over here. And as you can see, if I toggle their vision, they did have a ward around here, so this would have been impossible for me to enter this area without hex flash. It doesn't actually result in anything, but um, yeah, this is just another spot where hex flash can be really good. Or if I was on blue side, uh, I could look to just hex flash from here into this bush or um, if we were looking to dive mid, I could potentially move around here, look to hex flash over here. You get the point. So for the rest of the laning phase, I'm just going to be leaking my pressure towards mid lane. Um, we are winning 2v2 really hard, and I'm going to use roam windows to leak that pressure towards mid so that I win bot, and then I allow my mid to win, and then I allow my mid and jungle to win, and then we can stack neutrals, and then in the mid to late game, uh, we're in a much better spot where we hopefully have mid tower advantage and I can just set up around mid and look for picks, look for number advantages, look for skirmishes in my favor and avoid those just straight up 5v5s with no advantage. So once again, I'm just looking um, towards bot lane and to leak that pressure towards mid. I'm posturing aggressively, but I don't want to hook right now because I know that their mid and their jungle are potentially in the vicinity. So what we're going to do is we're going to crash a stacked wave and then we're going to look for a fight. Um, so this is the other thing that you can do with stacked waves. And this is an opportunity that you can't get if you just crash uh, single waves the whole time. Um, if you have a stacked wave, you can use this uh, time to roam or, or to do dragon or to just dive the enemies on a on a stacked wave and Nautilus is great at diving if you don't use your hook like I did in this situation it would have looked 10 times better but we were just doing some wave management with Nautilus um, we missed our first Q so then the rest is a little bit dodgy for us to control but um, once again our wave state is in a good spot and I'm going to base and use my roam window to move towards mid once again. And this is just the way that this, um, the last five minutes have been playing out is that I've just allowed my mid laner to have constant safety. And if their mid laner ever contested any kind of prior around here, I would be popping out and killing them. My Yasuo, he's, he would be really happy with this map state. He's allowed to free farm, he's allowed to play as aggressively as he wants, and he's uh, just given full agency 
with uh, me translating our bot pressure towards mid. So this is something that you don't have to do. You don't have to just like stay bot and continuously look to kill bot. And then your mid maybe loses um, because the jungle is not going bots. And then it's kind of like a bot lane versus the rest of the map situation where you can actually just carry your whole team by translating your pressure. And Nautilus is a great champion to do that around fog by mid with his broken Q. Um, he can find picks very easily. So I'm just coming back bot. And I find a hook and we just get another kill. Even if Zillion wasn't out of position here, uh, I would be crushing this next wave and then using that stacked wave to either dive or to pressure the rest of the map, I'd most likely dive. So we get a kill there and that's what Nautilus is really good at, finding random kills with his hook. And then I am denying this gigantic wave. If Jinx hung around, I would just press my ults on her, then Q her and she'd be dead. And then I'm once again leaking my pressure towards the middle of the map. And I try my best uh, to help my mid laner. We get a kill. And this is just going to be how the game plays out. I am much stronger than Zillion in the early game. And I want to generate a bot lead. And I want to leak that towards mid and jungle so they can have a lead. And then in the mid to late game, hopefully my teammates can carry. Um, Zillion is going to hard outscale me, but that's just one member. And I still will be able to find engages for the team. But I really want to give as many resources to my teammates as possible for them to carry the game later on. So there's a big fight down here that goes wrong. I don't have my ult. I don't have my ignite. I don't have my flash. And yeah, this doesn't go too well. But what I want to pay attention to afterwards is just I'm doing the exact same thing. I am controlling towards mid. I'm even playing around the vision here. Um, so you could see I was hex flashing to avoid vision around mid. I'm doing it the same here. They can't see any of this happening. Um, and allowing my Yasuo to become uh, a scary force later in the game. And then I do the same here once again. So for this laning phase, I didn't really do anything special. I even messed up my level 2 spike. But I did look for short trade windows, I looked to pressure from fog, and I used wave management to generate a 2v2 lead, and then for the rest of the early game I translated, I leaked that pressure towards the middle of the map, um, which really helped my mid and jungle to be relevant in this early game. So what we're going to do now is jump into another early lane review and see how we go. So in this game, we're in Nautilus vs Karma, and we did a bit of an early invade, so I didn't have time to swap back to my sweeper. Um, but yeah, let's just jump right into it. We noticed that they come from our red side, so our red's probably gone, but I can't just allow them to walk straight to lane like this versus Nautilus. I'm going to look for my short trade windows. You see, I do my Q, I get my auto passive proc'd, and then I just instantly back off to minimize exit damage and keep the trade as favorable as possible. And then um, that's just going to set up my level 2 spike to make that all in that much easier. So even if this was just an isolated 2v2, with its, which it soon isn't going to be, this is a great spot. I'm going to be able to use uh, my relics on the second wave melees, get level 2, and then if my hook hits the server, she's dead. If, she, if it doesn't, she'll flash. And that's a win-win. But yeah, what ends up happening is our Javan uh, just comes around and we just get a couple kills here whatever we're gonna shove the wave and we're gonna base and then I'm going to uh, have a look at bot wave from base and think if I need to move mids or to move bot and all the while I am uh, maximizing my uh, uptime by spider manning off walls um, so I'm going to use it on the turret there and then I'm going to use it on the wall here and then I'm going to blast cone and this is just going to trim a lot of the fat uh, and be really efficient with my movements. And I decide that I want to move bot and try to hold the freeze. 
So that's what I do. And now I'm looking for uh, a hex flash into a trade. The unfortunate thing is that my ADC just used both her Q and her E for not much avail. So this would look much better if she held on to her spells there. And then I can jump on here. Uh, but still, you can see the strength that Hex Flash can have. I crept into the bush and then I can potentially find and engage. So I'm trying to prevent this crash, but they have way too many minions here. They're both ranged. It's not really viable for me to stop this. So I have to let this crash. And I'm preventing them from taking my pink. And yeah, the wave. And the lane is in kind of a, an equated state right now. I noticed that Karma is not respecting the, the fog. She's trying to contest in the side where Nautilus just has free reign to hook bushes for free. Um, so I go for hook. And here I hook and then I auto and I W. And my mana pool is quite low. So what you'll notice here is that I don't use my E. The E is quite a big mana sink. Uh, 50 mana, especially if you're running quite low on mana in general. The Q and the W can really do most of the heavy lifting for a trade. So if I used E here, I would pretty much only have one QW left for the rest of the laning phase or for the rest of this uh, section of the lane until I base. I don't want that. I hold on to my E. So here our wave stays pretty good. We are posturing to try and clear this ward, but it's obvious that their jungler is moving down. So I'm slightly out of position. Uh, if I was a little bit more this way, I can just queue out here and I would avoid the Siva queue and the Karma queue. But anyway, our wave state is in a good spot. And you will just be able to find windows to find hooks uh, on this champion. It's just, that's just how it's going to be if you're looking for it. So yeah, your opponents have to be really diligent in avoiding your hooks. Uh, if they move out of the minion line on this side, you can hook them. If they even move out of the minion uh, line on this side, you can just as easily find a hook. And here's the part where Nautilus's Q hitbox is a little bit funky. It has a, a wider hitbox for champions than it does for terrain. So a, a hook like this, if this was a champion, it would it would get hooked. But this is a terrain, so it moves past the terrain with its skinny hitbox, and it latches onto the karma with its fat hitbox. And then I can look for another short trade. Um, I'm trying to force a flash. And that's exactly what we do. Um, so after that wave, I could easily have decided to try and shove this one wave in base. Or I can pressure the map, meet up with this next bot wave, and crash that stacked wave. This also helps to provide some pressure relief towards mid. Um, so I'm just going to speed it up a little bit here. Uh, we're looking for a quick pick over here. Once again, Hex Flash. This could have surmounted to a pick on Karma. It just didn't work out this time. She's playing around it. And then we crash uh, the stacking wave. Great. Uh, we overstay a little bit for a plate. Not the end of the world. So my tempo's a little bit scuffed, and especially since my base got stopped, it's scuffed again. But we crashed a wave, and uh, they crashed the following wave. There's no point in me returning bot. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to once again Spider-Man my way towards mid. And look to pressure the map around this area. I'm looking for pinks. I find a trinket. I noticed that she just walked over here and potentially placed some vision here. So I'm staying in fog. I'm... Uh, leaking my pressure towards the middle of the map and my yeah my ganks are just really effective on this champion so i wrap around i find a q i do my auto w we get a kill on mid we get a kill on jungle um, the net result of this doesn't look too hot but you know this was a really good spot for our team to be in it just yeah it happens right the enemy support is nowhere to be seen, and I am translating my pressure towards mid and jungle, which is the important part here. I fix the wave. My ADC dies for no reason. His wave was perfectly fine. Uh, we can just go back. 
uh, he was able to crash a wave and he just overstays and hits the tower. Um, so this was a good roaming window for me. And yeah, in the 8 to 14 minutes section, I am just pressuring mid. I am trying to generate pressure through the mid lane because mid waves crash first and it's really important. And so that we have the possibility to do Herald, which is really broken as well. Um, and my constant pressure towards mid has kind of coerced Karma to follow. And these kinds of fights, Nautilus is way more effective than Karma, way more effective than Enchanters in general. Enchanters, they need to sit in lane, they need to generate HP advantages, they need to have long extended fights. And if you can force the enemy support to uh, play into your strengths, that's great. And if they're not, then uh, you just find your roam windows when they're effective and then you can move back bot to prevent a dive or whatever. But yeah, Nautilus, th these are really good fights for him. Um, it kind of sucks that all of these examples, the result is bad. So we just mess up this fight pretty bad. I, I go for a flash hook, he flashes it, and my Javan EQs. And then he flashes and then he just instantly dies. Um, Sion misses everything, so this execution is disastrous, but this is a really good fight. Uh, these, these types of fights are really good for Nautilus. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at a Samira Nort lane versus Jin and Braum. Um, obviously, Samira and Nort has a lot of kill threats, um, so that's what we want to look to do. But Braum is quite hard to all in verse. So let's see how we navigate this early lane. Jin is going to get the shove over Samira. He just spams Q on the wave, and it's very hard to deal with that. So we're just going to be patient. We're going to gracefully lose early prio, and we're going to look for an all-in opportunity whenever it presents itself. So we're taking a little bit more damage than we should. But like you've seen in other games, your opponent has to be really, really diligent versus Nautilus, and that's just not going to happen. Um, so be patient and pick your moments. Here I notice that Jin is by himself, and Braum is sweeping a ward here. I get level 2, and then I look for a flash hook. And if he flashes it, great trade for me, right? Even if I didn't have Hex Flash. Uh, trading Flash for Flash with the enemy ADC is fantastic. If he ever gets hooked in the future, he can die. The, uh, he's very susceptible to getting ganked and dying. Um, but yeah, it's quite likely that they don't flash in time as well, or they just don't respect your all-in. So I flash hook W, and I'm posturing forwards, and I'm trying to force an all-in here. And yeah, if he survives, then I mean... He loses complete control of the lane and he has no sums. If he dies, even better. The damage hasn't really been done, but uh, Samira follow flashes and kills him. Great. And so now we're going to use this opportunity to shove uh, a stacked wave uh, and crash it and then reset. And then once again, we're going to have that favorable wave state. We're going to be spider manning from base as usual and trying to uh, pressure around mid and then prevent the crash later on. So we're moving back down bot for this wave. And yeah, the goal is to try and prevent this crash, uh, this stacked wave from crashing, which is going to be quite hard. That's a huge wave. My Samira has not or cannot trim the wave at all. Uh, so they're trying to escort the wave in. I'm trying to hold it. My jungler's coming down as well. Um, so I'm trying to waste their time. I'm trying to entice them forwards uh, for them to break my freeze. Um, and they take the bait. They're running really far forwards now. <laughs> and so I just find an engage on Braum while he's like even in my tower range. Easy clean up here. And it doesn't take a genius to tell that this is wave management, right? This is this wouldn't happen if uh, the shoe was on the other foot. If we had a giant wave, uh, we were trying to crash. Like, we can't kill them there. Here, I'm threatening the freeze. They have to respect it. And then you just keep that up. You, you get another good wave state. We crash another wave. Um, I actually use... A brief window to roam towards mid. So the mid, uh, the middle of the map is like really struggling this game. Um, our mid jungle pressure is not looking too hot. So I need to find windows to relieve pressure around mid jungle. 
And so here is an opportunity that I missed. I tried to move back bot and hold this freeze and I misjudged it the wave, uh, the, the melee and the cannon ends up crashing and now I should instead be around here and I should be uh, dropping a pink either here or here and relieving pressure towards the middle of the map given that I can't stop this crash. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to jump forwards a little bit in this game and it's uh, much of a muchness. Our bot lane is doing quite well. Uh, we have a lot of pressure but our mid and our jungler is really struggling. So here's a, an opportunistic 2v2 that we take. I find a hook and I find the double ult and I back off, Samira jumps in, gets a kill. And this was quite touch and go because of the tower shots that I took. It ends up all right. But this is just another example of looking for these 2v2 kills, um, especially paired with uh, Samira or any other champs like Kaisa or Tristana, all in champs like that. So we talked about how enemies have to be really diligent versus not. Here is a lane where you're the one that has to be really diligent, and that is versus Pike. Um, and it's amplified with the fact that I have a, a hard losing ADC early on as well in the Cassio versus Misfortune. And here is, this is before I had the either genius or crazy revelation of uh, Hail of Blades into the Pike. So I approached this lane as trying to minimize and look for opportunities when they present themselves rather than matching the laning power with the, the halo blades the cheap shot the uh, bone plating and the shield bash so let's just have a look at how this early lane plays out here i'm respecting the the mid bush because pike and mf are much stronger and you know, these situations are going to happen. Even if you don't necessarily uh, have to respect this on paper, maybe you mess up, maybe your ADC messes up, and you have to concede prior, and that's fine. You don't have to do anything special. You don't have to try and brute force prior here if you can't get it. You just need to stay healthy and wait for the opportunity to come. Okay, so they crash the wave. I am posturing forwards to look for windows to use my Q, especially... Uh, after waves have crashed so if there's not a long line of minions here that can block my hook i am going to look for opportunities here but if they back off they back off and if they don't then they're not being diligent enough but that's fine either way we're in a good spot okay i look for a hook it misses and um, here my cassiopeia is really mispositioning uh, obviously she needs to respect pike from being in fog here uh, with his hook so this doesn't turn out too well and i try to lock him down under tower it was just a really bad play but we're going to focus on the wave management aspect of this game they get to crash a stacked wave i am posturing to freeze it um, and if they let me freeze it then great and if they don't then they have to move forwards and mess up their tempo right so they were trying to base and then i move forwards to hold the freeze and now they move forwards to stop me and now their base tempo is bad um, and so yeah the wave crashes and i don't deem it safe to contest the next wave so i'm just going to base and come back to lane on potentially this wave or the following wave. I'm going to use this brief window to roam Spider-Man around and relieve pressure around mid. Keeping an eye on bot wave. I know that I have to be bot soon. And so I'm going to move bot here and try to help break this freeze. Crash the wave, find a hook. So yeah, not, not much to talk about here. We just cleared the pink, getting a chunk on the pike. Um, once again, I'm respecting the duration of these trades. I'm not overstaying. I know my strength. I, I, it's kind of like CC and burst, and then you get out. So I find my hook, I find my auto E, my, uh, my auto W into E, and then I'm just running. And I don't want any kind of extended fight here. 
Unfortunately, my flashless Cassia gets hooked once again, and she's dead. And this is just a bit of a rough game for her, and just for our 2v2 matchup. So I'm going to come back bot, and I'm going to try and crash this stacked wave. Um, they hold the freeze, I'm trying to get my jungler to help break the freeze. I'm pressuring from fog. We break the freeze, and we find a dive. Um, so don't be afraid to call for dives on these stacked waves. Uh, this champion is really broken at dives. What you can do is you can um, auto attack the enemy and Q out afterwards, or you can just Q the enemy and then use your innate tankiness, especially with aftershock to tank and drop or whatever. Um, engages and especially not are really good at dives. So <laughs> what we're going to see here is we're, we're going to find a dive and we're going to have some more experience of Nautilus's Q hitbox. So here this Q is going to hit her and then she flashes here and then the hitbox extends and creates a little T on the end, hooks onto her there. Find a couple kills here. I know that I'm going to die so I'm just trying to tank for my team. And now all of that early lane has just, their lead has disintegrated. Um, we didn't do anything special once again. We were just trying to minimize damage. Uh, Cassio was mispositioning a little bit, but eventually we had a stacked wave. Our jungle was around. We called for a dive. We got the kills and we traded our life for it and it's super worth. And now we're just on track to outscale. So I actually had a chance to test out my Halo Blades theory the day after I decided that it might be strong. Um, just to reiterate, it's the cheap shot, it's the bone plating, it's the shield bash, it's the hail of blades to have as mo uh, have as much lane power as possible versus the pike matchup. I was doing a lot of limit testing, I was seeing what I can and can't do. We're just going to have a look at some examples here um, of when it actually can work. And before I look at all of these timestamps, I think this is actually a viable strategy to answer pike and only pike. Um, you could take it in other matchups, but this laning power is not what you need. You can still win lane with Glacial or sometimes with Aftershock, and you don't need to over-index in two lane stats. But this Pike specifically, who is one of the strongest laning champs uh, bot lane in the game, I think it is quite a good idea. All right, let's have a look. So here's the first one. I am hanging around mid, and I am looking to counter a gank. And that's exactly what happens. Pike shows up and I just wail on him with like four, <laughs> four autos in a row with Hail of Blades. Um, it is worth noting that Hail of Blades, uh, it doesn't reduce its count with auto attack resets. So with my W, it's not going to count to one of those three uh, accelerated attacks. So we can just see what I mean here. Uh, I get my first auto, I cancel my uh, animation with W, and then I still get uh, two or three more. I still get three more, um, but yeah, that's the first example. Let's jump into the next one. There's another fight, I think, around here again. And yeah, I do uh, a lot of damage. Uh, we don't quite manage to pick up the kill, but yeah, this is this is pretty useful. Having so much damage, he gets really low, I, I wait for my hob cooldown to come back up, and then I find a hook, boom, 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 and then he dies, and that's definitely a, a hob-specific trade right there. And I think we're going to jump into one more around uh, these river skirmishes. So here, boom, boom, boom. Obviously, I wouldn't get those orders without hob. And the main reason that I am looking for this is for the 2v2 potential. So let's have a look at a, a 2v2 fight. I think it comes up around here. Okay. And yeah, this is just, <laughs> this is a lot of burst, right? He doesn't even have time to try to escape at all. And this is just all of the damage uh, adding on top of each other. The cheap shots, the uh, the shield bash, the hob, and the bone plating helps for any kind of return trades, but 
Yeah, I feel like I should put a, a warning on this build, almost a, a do not try this at home unless you're really comfortable with it. I, I still need to explore this build more fully. But yeah, like I said, I think versus Pike, this can be viable. And Pike, uh, yeah, he's really strong in the early lane and then he falls off really hard. So even if you match his early lane, you're not going to get outscaled. So this could be a win-win type of build. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at a game where I'm playing Renata into Nautilus. And you can see the potency of, uh, first of all, the counter matchup uh, alongside having a favorable wave state. And Nautilus is really going to struggle in these types of wave states where it's frozen on the enemy side of the lane. He doesn't have the space to find hooks. Um, he doesn't have uh, space to engage, to look for all-ins. And we can just use our range advantage here and poke them whenever they go for last hits. Whenever Kaisa looks for last hits, whenever Nautilus to use, looks to use his relic stacks, we're going to be poking. And once again, they have to be very diligent and patient and just trying to fix this wave state. And if they can't, then we're in a really good spot. And I just wanted to show this uh, uh, example just so that you can see what Nautilus wants to avoid. This could be a Nautilus, this could be Renata, this could be a lot of champions, maybe other engagers, but wave states like this, Nautilus really struggles to function. And the Nautilus here, he gets frustrated. He tries to find an all in here, but there's just absolutely no chance because the lane, uh, the wave state is here. It's right by our tower. There's no space to all in like this, and they get rightfully punished in a 2v2. Um, so yeah. Look for opportunities to freeze it on your side of the lane or look to crash stacked waves. And that's what this Nautilus should have looked to done, should have looked to do in this state. They need to both ensure that this wave crashes and then they're good. Okay, now that we've talked about Nautilus's early game, let's talk about his mid to late game. And the main point for Nautilus in the mid to late game is going to be around mid control. You need to control around mid lane. He excels in picks. Uh, around mid waves, around the mid lane, or from fog, uh, from the mid bushes. Um, here is the win-win situation that you want to create with Nautilus in the mid to late game. You're playing around mid wave. If the enemy contests mid wave, you engage. You look for hooks. You look for picks. Um, you can easily look for a Q and then look for an ult afterwards. Your champ is really strong, just in a straight up uh, mid wave contest. If they if they concede mid wave, then um, you you get your mid prior, you use that pressure to move it towards uh, either side of the map of your choosing. You'll have a pink and a mid bush. You'll control a river and then you will have the vision advantage and control for whatever objective that you're controlling towards. And then if they decide to contest that objective, they have to face check and you can look for hooks and ults from there. Um, and this is why... Um, it's so important to control through mid as Nautilus. And if you ever have a mid tower discrepancy, so your tower is dead and theirs is not, it's going to be a really hard uh, mid to late game for you. And the best way that we can avoid this is that we play out the, the early game. We play out the first 14 minutes well. Um, we generate a bot lead. You're using your strengths. You're really strong in the 2v2. You're really strong roaming. You use your roam windows you start to shift pressure towards the middle of the map and you use that pressure to uh, secure Herald. And then you're going to have the mid tower advantage instead of the opponents. And then you can easily get mid prior. Nautilus, um, if all towers or uh, were either both up or both down, then he can get mid prior. If you have a tower advantage, it's super easy for you to get mid prior. prior. If you have a tower disadvantage, it's really hard for you to get mid prior, and then Nautilus starts to be really hard to pilot. He isn't mobile enough to try and move through side lanes, and if you can't get picks on mid wave, then he's just going to be really hard to execute. So just keep that in mind. Um, he can fish for picks relatively risk free, unlike um, more committal engaged champs like we've mentioned the Alistair, the Leona, the Rel. If they want to look for a pick, they have to use a big cooldown or they have to throw their body at the opponent. And if it's not the best time, then they're just going to die or get chunked or whatever. 
Nautilus, he can throw cues, um, he can fish for free, very low risk. If it hits, it hits. If it doesn't, whatever. Um, so that's the other <coughs> ease of execution and um, forgiving nature of Nautilus. I want to talk about team fights now. So for Nautilus, you can point click uh, on a carry, obviously, for a guaranteed engage. And what I want you to look for when you are using Nautilus's ult is to look for multi-man ults. There should be very few instances where you only ult one person in a team fight. Your single man ults are going to be around picks or around midwave um, when it's just 2v2, something like that. Even then you should look for two man ults. But yeah, hopefully with the combos that I have showed you uh, and you actively looking for multi man ults, that's what's going to happen in your team fights. Look for multi-man ults and make sure that your teammates can follow up on your CC. There is no point in ulting someone or ulting the entire enemy team and your teammates are still a screen away. You can give yourself a pat on the back, but it does absolutely nothing. Your teammates need to be able to follow up on your CC. You're not an assassin. You're not a burst mage. You set up your teammates to pick off the enemy team. Okay, multi-man ults, make sure you land your CC when your teammates are nearby and also when they have their abilities up. <coughs> um, but yeah, he struggles in the front to back, as we've talked about before. Uh, his R is slow, um, it's relatively short range, it's easy to react to, and his Q gets blocked by frontline champions. So you want to avoid this straight up even footing 5v5 situation. And the way that we are going to avoid that is through that mid control. You get pressure, you control first. They have to enter your vision. You find a poke or a hook or a positional advantage and you avoid just a straight up 5v5. They're organized five, you're organized five in a river and you have no inherent advantage. On this note, um, if you are in a 5v5 and there are, the fight starts to get chaotic, you need to embrace that chaos. Um, if there starts to be a 2v2 here, a 3v3 there, someone is not sure exactly where to pass and he gets slightly split up, you pull the trigger, you inject some volatility and chaos into the fight because in a straight up 5v5 front to back you are going to struggle. So what that would look like is maybe the front line peels too far forwards uh, and then their back line is more exposed, you pull the trigger, you engage on them or a fight is starting to extend out and some people are dying on either side and then you hard commit once their front line is damaged or dead, things like that. So just be ready to pull the trigger in these situations and not just wait around and hope that the perfect opportunity is going to present itself in that 5v5 fight. Look for an opportunity when it gets a bit messy, pull the trigger. And that's going to be the best chance that you are going to get most likely. All right, so now we're going to have a look at mid to late game examples. And the main theme that you're going to take away from this is pressuring around mid. All right, so we're in the 14 minute mark. That is my official mid to late game transition point and I'm going to be pressuring around mid. That's just it. Pressuring around mid, looking to get mid prior when possible. If they contest our mid prior, you can look to engage, you can look to hook, you can look to flash alt, you can look to do anything like that. If they don't contest uh, the mid wave, then you shove the mid wave, you control whichever side you want, and then you can use that control to look for picks, to look for number advantages or anything like that. In this situation, they're contesting mid prior. I know she has no flash, I'm just going to flash alt her face and um, yeah, we get a kill on the ADC. And it's it ends up being a two for one. Um, here's a quick example of <coughs> buffering the Q to dodge CC. So their Scion is ulting towards mid and then I let the ult hit, hit me and then I hook out. Um, then whatever happens, happens. I'm going to look for a window to find a base and just do the exact same thing. I think towards mid side, we get mid prio, I control, and then I'm hovering in fog. I should have cleared this pink, but um, yeah. Constantly posturing around mid, one of these hooks is going to land, um, or when my ult is back up, I can hex flash ult someone. And this is just the way that you want to pressure in the mid to late game. Mid prior and then lean towards one side. 
So here, mid prior, they don't contest this wave. Great, we get this wave of prior, and then we get to move to this side, right? <clears throat> Dragon is coming up in the near future. So I was doing a good job of pressuring around mid, controlling around mid, and then I really start to end. So we control this area, and then Cyan leans up. I don't respect the lean. Um, I could either be looking to collapse on Cyan here because everyone will be able to uh, collapse on Cyan here and they'll all be stuck over here. Or I just move back and uh, wait for my team to group up or get the next wave of mid prior forced him to catch it and then control this area once again. So I'm out of position. I waste my hook <laughs> and I ult one person and it's the support. So I played this fight horrendously. So we're going to skip past this fight, we're going to come back out of base, and we're going to control mid once again. Sprinting towards mid. Controlling mid vision. Staying in fog when possible. Getting mid prio. And it's just, this is just the story of mid game for Nautilus. Uh, Push mid and then move and control an area. And then push mid and then control an area. Here we use our window to just instantly one shot Baron because we have Cassio and Brand. And here Nautilus is broken where he just presses R on someone and they're going to die. And then once again, pressure through mid. And there is very, very little counterplay to this. Uh, as I have said before, if they can test mid, then you're going to have openings to find alts and hooks and you can sit on a pink on uh, the mid bush of your choosing and look for hex flash or picks from there. If they don't contest, you use that pressure and move to whichever side you want. Find another hook around mid. And yeah, this whole mid to late game has just been pressuring around mid and being diligent, shoving up mid wave, controlling the side of my choosing. And then, yeah, the results speak for themselves. I'm going to have a look at one more example around here. I sprint straight to mid. I'm sounding like a broken record, but I move mid, I get my mid lane wards, and then we find a fight around this area. Yeah, and the rest is history. Okay, we're going to go back to this Nautilus Vazillion game, and now we're in the mid to late game. And I really don't want to go on too much about these mid to late game uh, examples, because they're really going to be a lot about controlling through mid. And what I will show is just a few examples of how you can expect team fights to look. Okay, pressuring through mid, get mid prior, control the side that you want, and then look to set up a pick or a team fight. Um, they're moving into our vision and they're not all organized in a 5v5 right now so I can look for an engage I find a hook and then I look for a, a double uh, a two man ult the jungler gets blown up and then the zillion has to escape so that's all well and good um, and then after <clears throat> after the initial fight um, Nautilus is a, is a, a pretty good champion. I mean, it's not an organized 5v5 uh, on even footing that he wants to avoid. This is a skirmish, and they have to enter our vision, and they have a couple members dead, and so if I can find a hook onto a carry, then great. I find a hook onto a carry, they have to blow their KLO, I die, doesn't matter, they're all going to get cleaned up afterwards. Um, so they all got cleaned up, and three guesses as to where I'm going to pass from base. I'm going to pass mid from base. Posturing around river. There's a bit of a fight going on here. We'll wait until the aftermath. Moving back towards mid. Getting that mid prio. Um, yeah, getting that mid prio and then <clears throat> using this pressure to do something. Uh, in this instance, we looked for a kill on the enemy ADC. We could have used this window to control vision around here. Um, 
but yeah, once again, pressuring mid. And the opponents are not playing perfectly diligently, so opportunities present themselves. We shove mid, and I know the Zillion is potentially going to get into my ult range. <clears throat> so I ult him. If he flashes away, cool. If he doesn't, he dies. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to skip forwards towards a big team fight over here. Where you miss about five minutes of me pressuring around the middle of the map. I'm going to Spider-Man back onto the map. And <laughs> we're going to pressure mid. Do some vision uh, housekeeping around top side. Move back to mid. And here's going to be a team fight. So this is not the greatest team fight um, setup for our team. What we want to do is <clears throat> be able to shove mid and then uh, pressure. And then move back mid, shove mid, and then do something. Here it's more akin to a 5v5 standoff where Nautilus doesn't uh, have the greatest time and especially versus this comp which excels in the front to back. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm just going to try to find a hook on a carry and look to get a multi-man ult. And I mess up my hook here, but I do manage to get a multi-man ult uh, on the back end here. And then uh, once the fight, you know, thins out a little bit and I can hook onto uh, a squishy backline member, then I'm happy. So bad first Q, but a good uh, three-man ult. And then I'm going to find a Q onto a backline member once again. And this is just, uh, if my first Q was better, then obviously that would have been a, uh, the best fight possible for me. But, uh, you know, as far as Nautilus front to backs go, this is what you want to look for. Just make sure you get your multi-man ult. And do not use your ult at the start of a fight willy-nilly. Um, I could have easily just straight up ulted here. No one would have been able to follow up right now. Uh, Akali has used her cooldowns. MF is ulting here. So I'm going to hold my CC uh, until a better spot. And here is the better spot. When... Uh, my jungler is entering the fight. Now teammates can actually follow up on the CC. We're going to go back to that uh, Samira Nautilus versus Jin Braum game. And we're in the mid to late game. Once again, I am pressuring through mid. And I am looking for opportunities for picks around mid. If they can test, right? This is the win-win that you always want to be looking for. So they're not conceding prior. I look for a hook, I find a hook, and now I want to get a multi-man ult. And this is exactly what uh, Samir and Nautilus need to do uh, in order to function. They need to find these all-ins. And you need to be ready to pull that trigger when necessary. Um, so we find the all-in and we kill both of them. Um, and yeah, this is the, the story of Nautilus's mid to late game. Pressure through mid, look for opportunities to find picks. Um, use your pressure uh, advantage to set up uh, vision advantage and numbers advantage and give yourself an opportunity to find picks and avoid the 5v5 straight up even footing fight. Um, and yeah, in the team fights, look for multi-man ults. Don't be hasty in your cooldown usage. And once the fight extends and you can find that second or even that third hook, find them on those carries. And this is just what engagers need to think about in mid to late game team fights is how they are going to use their combo because they only get one shot. You only get one ult. Um, enchanters have a lot of uptime and they enjoy extended fights where they can constantly shield and heal and peel. Nautilus, you get one ult, you get one, maybe two hooks and you want to make the most of it. So be patient. Okay. You don't have to make hero plays the whole time. And a lot of the footage that I have shown, I've just done the right things. I have managed waves. I have looked for short, fast trades and backed off diligently. I've looked for opportunities where the enemies have misstepped and that's bound to happen. And then in team fights, I have played them quite poorly, but I conceptually, I'm trying to approach them uh, not very uh, hastily or over eager. I am trying to pick the right moments to find multi-man uh, engages when my teammates can follow up. 
I'm going to briefly talk about the 1% that separate the good Nautiluses from the great. This is going to look like uh, looking for multi-man alts and getting really familiar with the uh, combos uh, that I had earlier in the video so that you can guarantee these multi-man alts. Also, he has a great level 1 invade. <clears throat> so you can oftentimes just start sweeper and invade to uh, either side of the map of your choosing and find a lot of success. Another uh, something that's a lot cheekier is that you can look for a level 1 mid gank where you hang around and mid wave crashes before bot wave. So maybe you don't want to contest bot wave. Maybe you have a weak ADC matchup. Maybe the mids matchup is really volatile, something like that. You hang around uh, mid and then when the waves crash, you, you wrap around the wall and you look to gank. And this is uh, mainly done on red side. Wrapping around the wall on blue side is very unlikely. Um, so yeah, on red side, you can look to just level one straight up gank mid. Although you will potentially lose out on uh, bot prior, what they can do is potentially stack an uncontested wave and dive or something like that. But unlikely that they respond perfectly and you can generate uh, a mid lead and talk the mid later with this strategy. And the main point that you really want to do constantly is to uh, be Spider-Man and to just constantly hook off walls wherever you're moving on the map and start to learn which walls you are going to be hooking for the maximum efficiency. An example of this could be parving out of base and then hooking uh, the turret, the bot side turret on blue side and then hooking the next wall and then hooking another wall to blast cone or just getting used to where the best paths for spider manning throughout the map are so that you can really become efficient with your movements. The last point for the one percenters, I recommend that you throw your hooks um, as if the enemy is going to juke um, because your Q hit box is so generous that if you throw it for um, not a gigantic juke for, but for a quick juke at the end, even if they don't juke, you can make the, the edge of your hitbox still hit them, and then that'll help to give you the most successful cues. So for anyone who has made it this far in the video, I applaud you and I thank you for watching. Honestly, Nautilus is really fun, and I hope that this guide helps you to unlock its full potential and carry at all points of the game. And please let me know if you enjoyed this guide um, so that I can make more guides if this is the type of content that you're looking for. Otherwise, the School of Support uh, Discord server link is going to be down below as usual. You can join this for support resources or for coaching from me or just to enjoy a growing support community. And thanks again for watching. Happy hooking everyone with Nautilus and bye.